thank you very much, David. And, uh, and thanks everybody for, 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 for joining us. I must say, uh, I've been really impressed with what the WFA have been doing in way of these uh, Zoom lectures and, and web, webinars uh, over the period of, of, of the pandemic. Uh, as the president, I would like to claim all the credit for it, but in fact, I've had nothing to do with it whatsoever. But I think it's been a really impressive effort by the WFA. I'd like to thank David uh, in particular, but lots of other people have, have been involved. I think it's been a really, really good effort. Well, as uh, David's pointed out from um, my from in his introduction, I'm going to be talking about the British Army in the First and the Second World War. Now, that might seem a bit strange, given this is a lecture been given under the auspices of the Western Front Association. But one of the most important developments in the history of the First World War in the last 15, 20 years, I would say, is the comparative element, whether it be comparing, I don't know, the British with the Germans uh, or, 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 or whatever, but actually I'm pushing it in my own work in a slightly different direction by looking at not only the British Army uh, in comparison with the armies of the Dominions in the First World War, so Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and so on, but also looking at the British and Dominion army of the armies, I should say, of the First World War in comparison with what happened to the same armies only 20 or so years later. As I hope to bring out this evening, there's some really interesting continuities, as you would expect, but some perhaps even more interesting and indeed surprising differences between two armies barely a generation apart. Okay, starting with a, a quote from one of my favorite authors, George Orwell. England is the most class-ridden country under the sun. It's a land of snobbery and privilege. Still, it is a family. It has its private language and its common memories. And at the approach of an enemy, it closes its ranks. To understand British officers in the two world wars, we need to understand the sort of society from which the army grew. It was hierarchical, it was heavily class-based, but the different classes were not necessarily at even at each other's throat. It possessed some unity. Yes, there were certainly some tensions, uh, but different social classes were not necessarily antagonistic. And in fact, the army is a very good example of um, an arena where people from different classes could come together and work in a relatively harmonious and productive fashion. Now, certainly in the era we're talking about between 1914 and 1945, you could look at or listen to an individual and straight away pin their social class. It was about the way they spoke, the way they dressed, their manners, their behavior, their lifestyle, where they went to school. Now, classes were actually porous. It's quite possible uh, for children to rise to, to higher social classes than their parents if they went to the right schools. Classic thing to do, of course, was if um, dad made money was to use that money to send off your offspring to uh, a posh school uh, and then maybe off to Sandhurst or Woolwich and to go into a smart regiment thus cementing your place in society. Douglas Haig is a very good example. Douglas Haig's father anyway. Right popular culture, dad's army of course. Um, it's been said that great comedy works if it's based around friction. In the British context, very often that means class. And the two figures in the middle, um, Captain Mannering and uh, the, uh, the air raid warden, I think capture that very well. Captain Mannering, of course, is a grammar school boy who has ideas above his station. Um, the air raid warden, as a, as, a, as a chip on his shoulder, it's all about class. And of course, Sergeant Wilson on the uh, uh, on, on, on the, the right of the screen as I'm as I'm looking at it is from a different class again. 
for Captain Mannering. And the fact that he's the sergeant and Mannering is the captain, NCO and officer, of course, sets up all sorts of, uh, uh, of, of, of friction, which, which goes one of the right reasons why Dad's Army is great comedy. Now, quite apart from putting this up, I uh, think it's a very good example of actually of, of, of a, a comic take on British class in the period we're talking about. One of the authors of Dad's Army was Jimmy Perry, born in 1923, and he claims that one of the first words he learned was common, as in, don't shout in public, that's what common children do. Now, during the Second World War, Jimmy Perry was in the army, and he was asked by an officer why he spoke like a public schoolboy. In other words, in this context, public means socially exclusive and, and, and fee play. Jimmy Perry replied that he, had, that he had attended a public school and was baff, met with a baffled, but you're only a sergeant. Why aren't you an officer? Certainly until 1945, arguably later, there was a widespread belief that skill in military leadership could be directly equated to a individual's position in society. This is like is a modern version of the ancient belief that war is the occupation of the nobility and gentry. And by the early 20th century, by 1914 certainly, this meant in practice that most regular armed officers had a private income and had been educated at a public school. Now, as only a small uh, proportion of the population attended public schools, defined at its most broadly, we're talking about 300,000 a year in England in the 1930s, this of course drastically limited the number of potential candidates for commissions. In 1914, only about 2% of British regular officers had formerly been rankers, in other words, uh, men who had passed through the ranks uh, and got, got a commission. And even some of these might have been gentlemen rankers who were posh but skint, if I can put it that way, and joined the army in the ranks with the hope of gaining a commission. Now that's not to say that the social profile of the officer corps remains static. Um, by the, the by the 20th century, upper middle class boys were increasingly following their fathers as the army. And of course, there was also a pecking order among regiments. And aristocrats were increasingly concentrated in a few socially elite units like the household cavalry and the grenadier guards. But as war with Germany became increasingly likely in the years uh, before 1914, um, the prospect grew of the army undergoing a major expansion. And clearly, if you're going to expand the army massively, you were going to need to get officers from somewhere. But little was done to find where these officers could come from. In 1907, there was a report which recognised that on mobilisation, the expeditionary force would be short of about 4,500 regular and nearly 4,000 territorial officers. Um, and the authors of this report noted that in some armies, like the French, officer, uh, officers were drawn from the ranks, but this option was dismissed because Britain did not have conscription. In other words, the explicit uh, uh, assumption was that whereas in France, uh, men were drawn into the army from all sections of society, in Britain, it was only the poor who joined the army uh, below officer level, and by definition, these could not make good officers. Now, one of the things which did come out of this was the formation of the Officer Training Corps, the OTC in 1907, based at universities and, and elite schools. Um, in some other words, they, they, in other words, they acknowledged the source of office, uh, the shortage of officers, potential shortage of officers, but they didn't actually do very much about it. Now, there were some dissenters. General Sir Ian Hamilton, who in 1910 was the Adjutant General, he feared that what he described as supply officers from the customary limited class would soon run out. And he suggested that junior non-commissioned officers, NCOs, could be commissioned in wartime. And in 1909-1910, the Army Council took a small step in that direction by the decision to 
uh, commission up to 50 NCOs when the war began. But even this sort of, uh, sort of baby step was controversial. Field Marshal Sir John French was wary of large scale commissioning from the ranks because he feared this would uh, change what he described as the exceptionally happy relationship which existed between officers and NCOs. In other words, what French thought was that working class soldiers wanted to be off officered by TOFs, not by people from the same class and them as they as they were. And actually, there's, a, there's some of it suggests that that actually was the case. The problem was partly cultural because officers had to fit into the society of the mess and live the opulent life of an officer. It was also a financial problem because living that lifestyle was extremely expensive. There were a very few, very dedica dedicated individuals. Um, Wally Robertson, the most famous one, who was a poor man commissioned from the ranks, who lived a very sort of um, abstemious lifestyle and managed to live, to live off his pay. But he was you know, very few people like, like that. Um, so when the First World War came around, they had to improvise a new system of officers. And as I'll be arguing a bit later, they failed to grasp the nettle in the interwar period as well. In the 20s and 30s, they once again failed to broaden the officer corps to any great extent. I mean, the same problem that, that occurred in 1914 came around again in 1949. Um, apropos of not very much, uh, if you look to the left of the uh, columns on the, the photo of Sandhurst, third window along at the top, that was my office when I was a junior lecturer there 30 odd years ago. Well, of course, in August 1914, Lord Kitchener, the newly appointed Secretary of State for War, took the decision to raise a mass volunteer army. And something like two and a half million men joined between August 14 and the end of 1915. And of course, large numbers of new units were formed. Um, but as Kitchener recognised, the demand for senior officers, sorry, for, for trained officers greatly exceeded the supply. So he had to resort to various expedients. Retired officers, unkindly nicknamed dugouts, rejoined the colours. The Sandhurst and Woolwich courses, of course Sandhurst was the for the infantry and cavalry officers, Woolwich for the uh, sappers and the gunners. The courses were, were shortened, fees were suspended, and immediate commissions were given to uh, OTC certificate holders at, uni at uh, universities and public schools. Officers of the Indian Army on leaving Britain were diverted to newly raised units. This actually was a terrible waste of a resource because of course the Indian Army itself proved to be absolutely critical um, for, the, for the war effort of the British Empire and uh, trained officers who spoke the languages of the Indian Army did not grow on trees. Diverting them to new army units I think was a, was a waste of resources. Another waste of resources was the raising of units such as the Universities and Public Schools Brigade of the Royal Fusiliers. Um, these were the very men for which uh, it was commonly believed were fitted to be officers and so why were they allowed to go off and serve as privates? The, um, the ranks of middle, uh, of, of middle class territorial class corps such as London Scottish also contain many potential officers uh, and some civic raised powers battalions. So, the, 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 so the, some of the battalions uh, of I think it was 93rd Brigade in 31st Division also contain lots of men uh, of officer potential. Well, while many of these other ranks in his categories were eventually commissioned, others died on the battlefield uh, as privates and NCOs. Again, arguably a wasted resource. Well, after the fight, the, the, uh, the fighting started, the army responded pragmatically to heavy casualties among officers by instituting mass commissioning of the ranks. So for example in late September 1914 105 warrant officers and NCOs were given commissions. The financial problem was partly overcome by a larger group, uh, larger grant I should say, for uniforms and equipment and of course missing expenses 
in a dugout on the Western Front uh, were much lower than they would be in a garrison in Aldershot in peacetime. And giving other ranks commissions had already begun in some units at, at home. Um, and pretty revolutionary for the British Army, officers started to be posted to regiments other than their own, which I think did something to loosen the bonds of the regiment in wartime. A critical moment came in February 1916 with the creation of officer cadet battalions, OCBs. And this rationalised officer training system. They were often based at ancient universities. This one, I think, on the screen uh, was based at Pembroke College, Cambridge. And they sought to give men from all sorts of classes a veneer of social respectability by teaching them gentlemanly manners, as well as providing military training. They literally gave them a knife and fork course, teaching them what sort of cutlery to, 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 to use and how to polite to behave in a gentlemanly way. A major difference between the OCBs and pre-war Sandhurst and Woolwich was that officer cadets were taught leadership. Before the war, they were not. They were assumed to have leadership qualities simply by being of the class were able to attend uh, Sandhurst or Woolwich. The name of the, uh, of, of, sorry, the, the rank that they were given at Sandhurst and Woolwich which was gentlemen cadets, which I think sp speaks, speaks volumes. Well, the pragmatic opening of the officer corps to talented but impecunious lower class soldiers who, for the most part, after mid-1915, were there because they had demonstrated leadership ability on the battlefield as privates or NCOs, provided the vast citizen army with sufficient officers to lead it. Eventually, most officer candidates, with very few exceptions, had first to serve in the ranks before they were given commission. Now, these commissions were temporary, hence the, uh, the snobbish jokes about temporary gentlemen. Te temporary gentlemen. And it was possible, although not easy, to convert these into regular commissions. Now, by, by, by my statistics, in 1918, something like 40% of officers were of working or lower middle class origin. Um, one of my uh, master's students at Wolverhampton is actually doing some work on this at the moment. And I suspect that that, that figure is going to, be, going to be revised as a result of his work. Um, such drastic changes in the officer corps did not occur without opposition though it was largely limited to snobbish comments about, as I just mentioned, temperate gentlemen. Providing senior regimental leaders for the expanded army presented particular uh, challenges. Uh, many serving and retired regular officers were promoted to battalion and, and, and company command or equivalent. Um, and to some extent, officers were promoted above that. Though, of course, there was in effect a glass ceiling in place for non-regular officers. It was rare, although not impossible, for new army officers or territorial officers to rise to the rank of brigadier general or above. Well, as the war went on, I suggest that a rough meritocracy emerged and military authorities became more pragmatic by appointing sizable numbers of non-regulars to command units at major lieutenant colonel level. On the battlefield, officers were able to demonstrate their competence at, as platoon and company commanders or in temporary command of their battalion or, or its equivalent, and thus, if you like, catch the selector's eye. The huge size of the army and the heavy turnover of officers through casualties meant there was always plenty of opportunities for advancement of competent leaders. And the line between regular and non-regular officers at regimental uh, level never disappeared, but I think it was blurred to a substantial degree. But after 1918, it was a different story. The officer corps mainly reverted to the pre-war status quo. In fact, no officers at all rose from the ranks between 1919 and 1922, I was surprised to find. There was a modest alteration in the social profile of officers. 
1923 Haldane Committee, um, uh, chaired by Lord Haldane, stated officers should no longer be drawn from any one class of the community, and its proposals aimed at democratising the process of officer recruitment, with more candidates being sought from grammar and even secondary schools. But little was done in practical terms to address the huge financial hurdles stopping lower middle class and working class uh, men from becoming officers. Because life in the officers' mess continued to be expensive. And there was still no viable career path for senior NCOs, warrant officers, such as sergeant majors, uh, to become officers. Well, even if it had been financially viable, why would uh, a regimental sergeant major, a hugely respected figure, exchange his position for that of a wart or lowly subaltern? There was also some problem recruiting officers from the traditional sources, traditional classes. Among other factors was the backlash against the losses of the Great War, and the emergence of the disillusion stroke futility narrative, and which produced in the late uh, 20s and early 30s, a short lived period when pacifism was intellectually fashionable, um, which made military service very unfashionable. I think again, I think it was George Orwell who said that it was uh, unfashionable even to know which end of a, a rifle the bullet came out of. Well, this was the context in which, in the mid to late 1930s, the War Office sought to broaden the social base of the officer corps. Uh, Lord Willingdon, in 1937, chaired a committee which produced a, a report. Uh, Willingdon's uh, uh, real name was uh, uh, Freeman, Freeman Thomas, which I thought was a wonderful combination. And um, the Willingdon report envisaged that a proportion of officers should be commissioned from the ranks and quote, the wider the net is cast, the greater the chance of securing men of ability to officer the, the army. In particular, they were looking to grammar schools, which were selective and fee paying, but not as expensive or socially, uh, as, as ex socially exclusive as officer schools, uh, as, as public schools. And these were seen as uh, potential sources of officers as of course they had been during the great war well this was a bit more than a modest step in the right direction the problem was uh the willingdon's proposals were overtaken by uh, by events namely the introduction of conscription in 1939 and of course in pretty rapidly or rapid order the outbreak of the first world war of uh, the second world war in any case, this sort of radical view did not find favour with everybody. Uh, in a very revealing comment, a very senior officer, General Sir Walter Kirk, argued that drastic measures to attract a new class of officer whose entry in any considerable numbers would probably have the effect of curtailing the existing supply from the superior classes would be a bad thing. In other words, he did not see the need to broaden the, uh, the background from which officers were drawn. Reminiscent actually of a comment in 1923 on a proposal for using the ranks of the Territorial Army, as the TF had been renamed, as a source of officers in a future war. Uh, the comment was, as in the First World War, the door might be, quote, inconveniently wide. In other words, there was a large dose of social snobbery going on here. By 1939, 30 places at Sandhurst and six at Woolwich were reserved for regular NCOs, 23 years of younger, um, but actually a fair number of those were gentlemen rankers. They weren't actually working classes at all. So thus, on the eve of the Second World War, the exclusivity of the regular officer corps remained pretty well intact. It continued to be dominated by products of public schools. In theory, the steps taken by the War Office in 1939 to provide officers for the expanded army were more efficient, more egalitarian use of manpower than 1914. So immediate commissions were granted to suitably qualified men, OTC certificates, 
But once immediate needs um, have been satisfied, all except a very few specialists, all officer candidates had to first serve, serve in the ranks. So far, so good. But actually, you dig beneath the headlines, old patterns soon asserted themselves. In the early part of the war, commissions, uh, um, candidates for commissions were very largely ex-public schoolboys and regular NCOs. In other words, the picture was not very different from that of 1914-15. Well, the same sort of tension between the regulars and the territorials commanding command appointments that marked the mobilization of 1914-18 resurfaced during the Second World War. In March 1940, the Army Council decided to remove some pre-war TA commanders and replace them with regulars. But in fact, this process had already begun. Lieutenant Colonel Donald Dean, uh, a Great War Victoria Cross winner, was removed from command of the 4th Buffs in October 1939. The divisional commander told him that he just did not want to have any territorial commanding officers because they could not possibly be as efficient as a regular officer for similar length of service. Well, this was tough on someone like Dean, but actually it wasn't entirely unwarranted. Dean was a victim of a major weakness of the army of 1939-1940, the lack of standardised training. So much depended on the views of individual commanding officers and lacking the extensive pre-war training of regulars, TA units were particularly vulnerable to poor quality leadership. So the, to the, the clear out of territorial COs is understandable if tough on individuals. Um, once again, as in the First World War, in effect, a glass ceiling was put into place, which made territorial officers, of course, no equivalent of the new army in the Second World War, it made territorial officers it gave a very, very tough task to get to Brigadier or above. And we must question whether this was an appropriate use of manpower. By 1941, there was considerable concern at the numbers and quality of potential officers. Things were different from the First World War. For a start, the army faced much stiffer competition from the Royal Air Force, much the same sort of man who became an infantry subaltern in the First World War became air crew in the second. The RAF was a, a glamorous and technologically based service with a reputation for being less stuffy, stuffy and less concerned with bull than the army. Not entirely true, but nonetheless, that was a reputation. And the army struggled to adjust to the demands of a masses and force in a people's war was epitomised by David Lowe's reactionary newspaper cartoon figure, Colonel Blimp, fat, pompous, slow-witted and tradition bound, who seems to have taken on multiple corporeal forms. Now, if you compare the look, the, the picture of Roger Livesey playing Colonel Blimp uh, in the 1943 film with the, uh, the portrait of the, of the general officer beside him, they might seem to be dead ringers, but actually, the general officer you can see, um, Sir Ronald Forbes Adam, the adjutant general, was anything but a blimp. He was liberal minded, um, a daily mirror reading, labour voting, uh, Wickhamist, liberal minded and willing to make radical changes. He's one of the, the, the great unsung heroes of the British Army in the Second World War. Uh, of all the non-active um, commanders, he actually did command a command corps in France in 1940, but there, there again was on the admin side, he I think was the most significant British officer of the Second World War. He faced multiple challenges to attract the best sort of officer uh, candidate and sufficient numbers. Not the least of these challenges was um, financial barriers, disincentives, and his reforms in 41-42 changed things to a degree, for example, by speeding up promotions from lieutenant to captain, meaning uh, men uh, officers got more money, and placing limits on daily messing charges. But there were still enormous problems getting enough high quality candidates. 
as in the First World War. Some COs were simply unwilling to put able rankers forward for commissions because they wanted to keep their best men. Even if potential officers were put forward, they then had to pass an interview board. These tended to be biased against candidates from non-traditional backgrounds, or more subtly, in favour of ex-grammar school boys. A social step down from the public school boy but regarded as being the next best thing. By spring 1941, some three quarters of newly commissioned officers did not have a public school background, but this figure actually concealed continued class bias in officer selection. About a quarter of the men selected for an officer cadet training unit, an OPTU, failed to complete their training, which led to shortage of officers, and the quality of some OPTU products left something to be desired. But in 1942, uh, two significant things happened. PSOs, personal selection, personnel selection officers, basically talent spotters were introduced, uh, and so were WASBs, War Office Selection Boards. Now these were much more scientifically based, which include, including psychiatrists and psychologists. Now the failure rate at WASBs was high, but nonetheless, the supply of candidates rose uh, by 65% by bid 1942. And by, by 1943-45, the rate of failure on OPTUs was down to 8%. So though imperfect, the system introduced by Adam in 1942 did result in a distinct improvement in the quality of officers being commissioned. And generally, the system was seen as much fairer. But nonetheless, the system struggled to keep up the demand for officers, especially for the infantry. Just as on the Western Front 25 years earlier, high intensity attritional fighting, such as in Italy and Normandy, for which read the Somme and Passchendaele, took a heavy toll on infantry officers. By 1944, the, the logistic and support tail rivaled the teeth portion of the army in terms of size. Now, this led to vacancies in posts which you know, weren't sinecures. But they did allow uh, officers to avoid the highly dangerous job of being an infantry platoon commander. One soldier turned down um, commanding a platoon in favour of becoming a lieutenant quartermaster. This would build on the admin skills he had, he had got during the war, but left unspoken was the fact it made his chance of surviving the war that much greater. Now, the shortage of infantry officers was ameliorated to some extent by the Can Loan Scheme, by which volunteer Canadian officers were seconded to British units, um, which actually proved to be highly successful, which says a lot for the compatibility of the different branches of the Imperial Army. Well, in both world wars, the regimental officer's role was in part managerial, to train his men and look after his welfare, thus enhancing their morale and combat motivation. But the other part of it was combat leadership. Paradoxically, this involved putting their men in harm's way by sending them or physically leading them into battle. This could place great demands on officers. Um, so much depended on how the Tommies, the other ranks, regarded the subalterns. Um, two examples there on the screen. A newly commissioned officer uh, wrote of the strain of constantly setting an example of the men, well aware the men were always watching him. Now, during the First World War, trust was aided by the essentially deferential nature of Edwardian society. People knew their place. Officers, at least the public school ones, uh, knew how to treat their men in a paternal attitude. Um, Downton Abbey has been, uh, you know, criticised by historians. One thing I think they do get right is the relationship between the classes, at least in theory. The idea of, uh, of, of paternalism being given in um, response to, uh, to, to deference. I actually had dinner with uh, Julian Fellows, who wrote Downton Abbey two or three years ago, and we're chatting about this. And after I told him that, he told me that I was the first historian who ever said anything positive at all about Downton Abbey, which if true, that's a bit tough. 
The officer training in the Great War taught paternal va values to men who lacked a public school background. In other words, they were, they were given a crash course in how to behave towards their social inferiors in a military sense, even though they might be from the very same social background as the men they were going off to command. Um, poor morale was often linked to poor uh, leadership. Uh, and if poor leadership was not forthcoming from officers, other ranks were perfectly capable of making their views known uh, and taking actions in their own rather than the army's interests. Now the situation in the Second Army in, in the Second World War Army was similar but not identical, as I'll say in a moment. But the things that were common was that officers tended to be judged by their soldiers by a fairly simple set of rules. Were the officers fair and paternal? Were they courageous? Were they competent? To some extent, though less so in 3945 than in 1418, when officers scored highly in the first two categories, get away with a less than stellar performance on the battle, especially if he was inexperienced. Needless to say, reckless officers, the ones like to get men killed, were not unpopular in either world war. The trouble was in the Second World War that the harmonious relations between officers and soldiers, very typical of the First World War Army, were not always the norm. Now, I'm largely here talking about the army station at home between 1940, between Dunkirk and D-Day in 1944, but don't forget that's most of the army. The bit fighting overseas actually uh, were not as big as, as, as the army at home. Two problems, I think, going on here, that the litany of retreat and defeat, Dunkirk in 1940, uh, uh, Norway in, in uh, 1940, Greece and Crete in 1941, Singapore in 1942, all of this had undermined the authority of the officer corps. In other words, they were some shine had been taken off, taken off of them. The other problem was that in a, in, a, in a large army which is not engaged on active service, they simply did not have the same opportunities sharing a trench, or a foxhole that uh, soldiers and officers would get to come to know each other and to appreciate each other's uh, abilities and courage that you've got on active service. So when you're doing endless exercises like uh, exercise bumper in 1941, um, they got soldiers got stale, they got fed up. And in, to be fair, the best officers actually realized this and did something about it. The problem did run deeper than this. Retreat and defeat between 1940 to 42, I think reinforced the, um, the futility narrative, which was very prevalent in the 1920s and 1930s. It actually, the Great War itself had helped to, not at the time, but later to discredit the officer corps. And society had changed between 1918 and 1939. As a general rule of thumb, the higher a soldier's social class, the greater resentment of officers' privileges tended to be. Older men and trade unionists also tended to be more critical. Britain was a bit more of an egalitarian society. It was a more democratic society. It was a bit more of a Bolshe society by 1939 than it had been in 1918. And I think one of the key problems the army had was that with exceptions of people like Adam, and indeed a different context, Montgomery, senior officers at first failed to realise this. This whole officer-man relations thing, I think, needs to be placed in context of the swing to the left in British society, which resulted in Labour's victory in the 1945 general election. Adam and other enlightened officers recognize that this new sort of soldiers needed um, careful man management and in a whole series of um, booklets that, that Adam um, issued to officers he made this clear in 1943 for example a circular letter which widely went out throughout the army 
he said that failures in man management led to poor officer man relations while outwardly discipline might appear to be sound it rests on an insecure foundation in the absence of mutual uh, um, confidence and he was even blunter in another circular issued uh, a month or so later he said that um, the general standard of man management is still bad in some units and below standard in, in, in far too many responsibility is of course as a regimental officer and the junior officer the fact that adam needed to make these statements about something which was absolutely central tenet of the officer's credo in the first world war illustrates the extent to which things had changed since the Great War and the way in which many ways the British officer corps had gone backwards. Well, officers of conservative views placed the blame for poor officer, uh, poor man management on officers from non-traditional, that is non-public school backgrounds. The most notorious one of these was Lieutenant Colonel Bingham, who commanded uh, an octu and remarkably stupidly at the beginning of 1941 wrote the, to the times basically uh, denouncing non-public school boys who had become officers he said that uh, the attitude of mind of looking after their people um simply wasn't there that that, that it was only possible uh, to to generate this from public school officers this of course conveniently overlooked the great success of first world war ocbs in taking men from humble backgrounds and training them to become effective and paternalistic officers. Does that mean the type of man being commissioned the Second World War was very different from those of the First World War? The answer was no. Um, but as I've already pointed out, uh, ranker officers in the First World War tended to get back in the front line very quickly. In the Second World War, more often than not, they were taking command of troops, training in the UK, getting bored and stale. It also strikes me, although I'm still doing some research on this, that officer training in the Second World War, at least in the first part of it, was simply not as effective in teaching paternalism and leadership to, 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 to men. Fascinatingly, um, it wasn't only sort of Colonel Blimp types like Le, 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 uh, Lieutenant Colonel um, Bingham, who actually thought this was, was true. Some radical thinkers believed it as well. Alan Wood, who was an Australian serving in, in the British Royal Artillery, who wrote under the transparent um, pseudonym of, of Boomerang, um, thought that quite simply these, these non public school officers were not very good. He thought that, quote, instead of supplementing the old Etonian officer with the qualities he lacks, they merely duplicate his deficiencies. They have no snob, snob appeal and no particular knack of handling men. And this actually does seem to have a fair amount of truth in it, that actually the training was simply not good enough to turn these non-public school officers into the sort of officers, officers needed uh, for an army in a people's war, unlike the training 25 years earlier. Well, clearly over time matters did improve, particularly as Adam's reforms in officer selection and training uh, took place. For example, in 1942, John Gorman attended a Royal Arm Armoured Corps Octu at Sandhurst, where it was called leadership and the motivation of one's men and the code of behaviour expected of, of, of a British officer. And there was an article on one particular octu. This is the subjects being studied, concluding with most important of all, uh, they learnt something of leadership and man management. Um, so there were some improvements, but it by, was by no means ideal, even in 1945. Well, the big difference, I think, is that relations between officers and men on active service uh, in the Second World War, as in the First World War, tended to be much better. Officers and other ranks shared dangers and up to a point the hardship of campaigning. 
and though the privileges and comforts enjoyed by commission ranks could, could be considerable and could be uh, resented. Um, and of course, on active service, officers had the ability to demonstrate real leadership, both in looking after their men, put inspection there, or literary leadership on the battlefield. Um, those who don't know it, the book 18, Platoon by Sidney Jarry, who was a platoon commander in the fourth Somerset in Normandy. I had the privilege to know him. He used to come regularly to lectures to Sandhurst, uh, officer cadets. I think is a, is a fine example of an officer of this sort. Well, under the conditions of active service, the gulf between officers and men could narrow to some extent. To take an example more of some random, in September 1942, a private wrote home from the Middle East. Officers and men get on better out here. Very, looting, very little saluting, etc. Uh, apart from a new mob just, out, mob just out from Blighty, and then it soon wears off. Our old OC used, used to chat with the night lads at night and come round joining in the brew schools. Imagine that in Blighty. In other words, west on, on, in, in the Western desert, things were rather different. Let's flip it round. Let's look at it from the point of view of the officer on active service. In early 1945, an officer of First Black Watch in Germany wrote this. I have formed a very strong bond of friendship with my men. This is partly due to the fact that as an infantryman, I'm closer to my boys than any other officer in the other branches of the army. We often share a trench and even perhaps the same knife and fork or last mug of tea, all tending us to make us a team instead of individuals. So there's plenty of evidence that an active service officer man relations were considerably better. And of course, in the Second World War, as in the first, territorial units tended to have looser discipline and more relaxed relations between the ranks. Uh, just give one example, uh, uh, Bill Cheel, pre-war territorial officer of the 6th Green Howards, uh, could be pretty cynical about the army, but had uh, a sympathetic and even admiring view of his officers. Um, so for example, his, um, his company commander, Major per Petch, uh, was a gentleman farmer in civilian life, he never forgot the lads were human beings as well as soldiers. And you see many examples of that in the First World War as well. One thing you did find, however, is that when soldiers did consider that they had been messed around, they were less inclined simply to grumble, as they were in the First World War, but actually prepared to do something about it. So, for example, the Second Royal Gloucestershire Hussars, uh, uh, veterans of desert fighting, a TA, a T TA Yeomanry uh, uh, tank regiment, were horrified when the new CO came out from England, tried to impose a surfeit of spit and polish on the regiment. This was a territorial unit, which was actually a, a, a veteran unit in, in, in the desert. Officers became very ang angry, but many of the other ranks wrote to their MPs and others to higher command, or they wrote to picture posts or the Daily Mirror. A very, very typical attitude of the sort of more bolshy soldiery of the Second World War than the first. Two more points uh, before I come to conclusion. The first one is that I've talked mainly about, I guess, teeth armed soldiers here, infantry, artillery, armoured corps. We should never forget that very large numbers of soldiers, both in the UK or in base areas such as India or Egypt, were doing jobs that were basically civilian jobs, such as repairing and surfacing equipment, equipment or working in offices uh, as clerks. Now, this is really testing uh, for officers to provide leadership for their men because they were denied the opportunity to experience increasing slack into rank comradeship on active service while doing, frankly, often very, very boring. Uh, office jobs or, or, or workshop jobs. A one senior officer commented in 1942 that technical units, ordnance and signals, for example, are deficient in management uh, because their officers really weren't trained to 
lead their soldiers. This did become better later in the war, but um, it was always a problem uh, and, and a very different one from that faced by the infantrymen. Let me finally give uh, an example of how the relationship between soldiers and their officer could change. Lieutenant Lyle arrived direct from the UK, uh, from an octu to the, um, the Queen's Bays, 2nd Dragoon Guards, uh, a regiment equipped with Sherman tanks in Italy in November 1944. He was described in the diary of one of his uh, one of his soldiers, Trooper Jack Mearwood, as a real twerp. He was a rookie, and after the troop leaders we'd had, this one had no idea how to handle men, especially someone who had been abroad and roughed it for years. Well, worth noticing that the, the emphasis on man management skills in Octu does not seem to prepare Lyle for command of a veteran tank troop. This problem was exacerbated by the fact that an officer was part of a tank crew was inevitably thrust into a greater degree of intimacy with his charges than, say, an infantry platoon commander. Also, the lack of automatic deference given to Dial simply because he was an officer, uh, to Lyle simply because he was an officer uh, by, by mere what is striking. But this was the beginning, not the end of the relationship. Um, and on January the 6th, 1945, so two months or so later, we find Mearwood writing, we were gradually training our Mr. Lyle, introducing to him to our way of life. He began to realise that the only way to live in harmony was to be, to a certain ex extent, one of the boys. We didn't take advantage of him. After all, he was an officer and had a lot of responsibility as our troop leader. Um, but it was impossible for him to try to live the life he'd here he'd been taught in officer training school. The leadership techniques that Lyle had been taught at Octu collided with the reality of life on campaign. Within two months of arriving in theatre, he'd had to adjust his leadership style accordingly. But Jack Mearwood recognised the importance of boundaries. Even in the cramped confines of a tank, to some extent, officers, officers and other ranks existing in separate spheres, and it was recognised by both sides that this was important. Okay, let's conclude. So I think that the effectiveness of regimental officers' leadership in battle needs to be placed in the wider context of the combat performance of the British Army. For both world wars, older works, 20, 25 years or so older, tended to stress the weakness and ineffectiveness of the British Army in 1418 and 3945. But modern historians stress that in both wars, the army underwent a learning process and over time became highly effective. I would say that the conflation of social class with leadership ability distorted the um, production of officers in both world wars, but after false starts, effective training and recruiting systems were established in the First World War and in the Second. Ironically, the more rational Second World War approach was less effective in reality than the flawed but pragmatic methods for recruiting and commissioning officers in the First World War. During the Great War, um, a military medal and a proven combat record did a great deal to overcome the handicap of an officer lacking the right social and educational background. Uh, Colonel Jack Dimmer, for example, promoted from the ranks, won the VC, uh, brought up in my neck of the woods in South London, pre-war regular. Um, in the Second World War, it's probably more difficult than that. Major John Howard, DSO, who led, of course, second Oxen Bucks Light Infantry at Pegasus Bridge in Normandy in the early hours of D-Day, betrayed, uh, portrayed, I should say, in the film The Longest Day by Richard Todd, ironically himself a veteran of Pegasus Bridge. He was portrayed by Richard Todd as a toff. That's how Hollywood expected a British officer to be. 
actually he was a former ranker who had left the army before the war, had become a policeman in Oxford, came back into the army and was commissioned through the ranks. A very, very hard but effective officer. Regimental officer, regimental leader le level leadership uh, for all that in both world wars was of crucial importance in the British Army's path to victory, both in 1918 and 1945. And as a report stated in 1944, regimental officers were match winners, but they could come from any social class, providing they possess the right qualities and are fully trained. By 1918, and 1945, that was becoming true. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much indeed, Gary. That was that was tremendous. Uh, Love that. Um, truly interesting uh, presentation. And in the best traditions, if everybody enjoyed that, if you'd care to raise your hands as a sign of applause on on the old computer there, and it's is the numbers there. That's uh, very gratifying Thanks to very be. Much. Uh, so thanks very much indeed for that. So it's now Q and A time. Thanks very much. Uh, everybody can uh, lower lower your hands now. That that's fine. Thanks also to the three volunteers, Rachel, Pete, and, and Michael, uh, for that. I'm just going to uh, um, stop your your three videos uh, if, if you don't mind. Right. So um, question time. Let's have a look. So the very first question that actually came in well before the actual talk started, um, Gary, was from. Malcolm Sperring Toy. Malcolm asked, are there any books covering the subject of other ranks being promoted to officers whilst in the field and were they returned to Blighty for officer training in places such as Sandhurst? So thanks for that, Malcolm. Oh, well, th th thanks, Malcolm. Um, yeah. Um, there isn't a full-blown book on it as far as I'm aware. Uh, I've got a complete, complete brain freeze uh, Pete Simpkins or someone else might remember the name. There was a, a PhD on ranker officers in the, sec in the First World War, which came out fairly recently, last two or three years. I must confess I haven't yet read that. It's actually on my to read list. Got as far as downloading it. Uh, my own work, I've looked at that in, in the broader context of officers in, in, in the First World War. Um, and this is very much something I'm dealing with uh, at the moment. I should have said that this at the beginning that, that this this talk is part of uh, the book I'm writing at the moment which is called Civilian Army, sorry Civilian Armies, um, the experience of Brit British and Dominion soldiers in the two world wars uh, and so I take as you can tell from that I'm taking a comparative approach and so one of the things I have been uh, doing very very uh, costly is looking at the experience of ranker officers and what 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 happened to them um, the talk I gave this evening was essentially um, one I gave in Canada a couple of years ago which I've actually written up for a book which is coming out later this year or maybe early, early next year I'm using this as the core which I will expand quite considerably and I will be talking about the experience uh, of, of ranker officers in, in both world wars in much, much greater detail. Not just the British Army, I'm also be looking at the Australians, Canadians, New Zealanders, and South Africans. Thanks for that, Gary. Right, so I'll just, um, Mike Atherton, let me just um, ask you to start your video. Um, you were uh, early with a question as well. Thank you. Uh, Gary, I'm quite interested in your comments on Orwell. Um, do you think, first of all, my, first, my question was, did he serve in the First World War? And secondly, was he influenced by what he saw there with his views that are quite radical later? And certainly some of his writings, which were um, perhaps not in keeping with the military. OK, well, no, he was too young for the First World War. He was born in 1903, I, I, I believe. Uh, but uh, his, his various of his writings show how shaped he was by the First World War. He was at Eton during, during the war and in the post-war period um, he clearly spoke to a lot of people and read a lot about the First World War. Of course he served in the Spanish Civil War and he makes, makes the point, I think comments in homage to Catalonia or one, one, of the, one of his shorter pieces, that for people of his generation who had been too young 
for the First World War, that's where they got their taste of trench warfare. Because in many ways, the fighting in the Spanish Civil War was more akin to the Western Front in 1915 than it was, well, some of it was, to, to, to later on. Um, of course, Orwell was a, was a, a, was a fairly radical socialist, um, but he, well, of course, famously in, in, in his book, The, 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 the Lion and the, and the Unicorn, he made a very strong plea for the fact that what he described as socialism and the English genius, that actually that uh, there was nothing wrong with being patriotic. It's just, I think he put it, the wrong people are in charge of the country. And he actually saw the, the Home Guard as being the, the potential, having the potential for a, rad, a politically radical force. Now, of course, because we think of the Dad's, uh, Dad's Army as, as the... Um, as, as our image of, 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 of the Home Guard. It sounds silly today. Actually, at the time, it probably wasn't so silly. Um, I think, without going into too much detail, I think what happens in 1940 is you do see a radical radicalization of the British people, which for all sorts of reasons express itself in constitutional means, it ends up not with revolution and sort of toffs being hung from, from, from lampposts, but in Labour being voted in 1945. But I, so, so I think that, you know, rereading his stuff, clearly he exaggerated the, um, the radicalism of the Home Guard, but it's not entirely as far-fetched as some people might think. So no, so, so Orwell was not a First World War veteran, but he was hugely influenced in all sorts of ways by the First World War. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for that. Um, Paul, Paul Colborn. Hi, good evening, Gary. That was wonderful, Hi, as expected. Uh, good to see you. Um, my question, uh, do you think the lack of class distinction contributed to the uh, poor discipline record within the Australian forces during the First World War? Right, okay. This is one of the... You've got a spare two hours? Don't invite <laughs> me back. I'll give a, a lecture just on this. Um, we need to be slightly careful here because... You're right, there was a very poor disciplinary record in the AIF. You're not entirely right, there was a lack of class distinction. Now, it, the class distinction was not as great as in the British Army, but it was certainly there. The Australians like to think of themselves as being a classist society, but believe me, they were not. If you look at the way, if you, if you look at the, the recruitment of officers, disproportionately officers came from the, the, um, the middle classes and indeed upper classes. Australian public schools were in many ways um, copies of, of, of their, their, their British counterparts. Actually, in recent years, I actually had, had the um, privilege of, of going out to two separate public schools in Australia as, as historian residents. And uh, put it this way, um, you know, it's like being sent back to the 1950s in Britain. They're, they're more British public schools than the British public schools are. So we should, we should, we should not buy into the classless nature of Australian army or society more generally by any means. Now, clearly there, there is a difference. I think that, that um, promotion from the ranks is, I think, a bit easier for the Australians. And also I think Australian soldiers who were promoted tend to go back to their own units more so than the British did. Did happen in some cases for the, for the British, but 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 not not in all. But uh, slightly hedging my bets, this is one of the other things I'm currently researching and would be dealing in in my book. Put another way round, um, Canadians who also have a bit of a sort of myth of classlessness. Well, just like the Australians, Canadian society was not classless, although it was not as class bound as as, as, as the British variety. Canadian discipline was much better. And one of the facts has been suggested for this is that the Canadians, unlike the Australians, but like the Brits, had uh, capital punishment. Uh, this is opening a huge can of worms. It does strike me that capital punishment did have an effect, uh, a, 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 a deterrent effect on keeping soldiers in line. In the Second World War, the British Army operated without the death penalty. Uh, and both in North Africa and in Italy, senior British officers, of course, had been junior officers in the First World War, wanted it brought back because of the problems of discipline that was bringing about. 
I, I believe I'm right in saying that the greatest disciplinary crisis suffered by the army in both world wars is the um, plague of desertion and going absent without leave in Italy in 1943 to 45. And at the time, it was very firmly believed that actually that's because they know if you, if you desert or go AWOL, you get picked up, you're not going to be shot. The worst you'll, you'll get is being in prison. Imprisonment or front line up a Monte Casino, you know, close call for some soldiers. But it is a subject that does need more research. And indeed, I'm going to be doing some over the next weeks and months. Thank you. Th thanks for that, Gary. Thanks. Ben Hodges. Hello. Yes. Hello. Um, thanks, Gary. Um, my question was something you sort of touched on towards the end. Um, was, there, was there much difference in the, the way that the army recruited and trained uh, specialist officers uh, between the, in the two wars. I'm thinking more sort of, you know, uh, ling linguists, uh, doctors, logistics, logistics specialists, engineers, all that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, can you can you sort of say that one one war they got it right and one war they didn't, or is it more nuanced than that? It's, it's, it is a bit more nuanced than that. I, I must confess, I haven't done, done really a, a much, much work on this. It strikes me it's a bit better in the Second World War. Because from the very beginning, there's more of an attempt to put round pegs in round holes. Um, in the First World War, of course, because the emphasis early on was very much getting officers for the infantry in particular, uh, you might be a linguist or something and find yourself, you know, as platoon commander and you go off and get killed as, as platoon commander. In the Second World War, I think there is more of an attempt uh, to sort that out. And in both World Wars, from the middle, middle of the war onwards, the exception to serving in the ranks before getting commission is for certain sorts of specialists. So you can actually still go in to the army um, you know, as a specialist in, 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 in some, some, some sort of way. Now the army in the Second World War is more consciously techno technocratic than the army in the First World War. What difference it made in reality, I'm actually not entirely sure, although I must cheerfully confess this is something I, st I, st I still need did still to do a bit more work on. So I would say as a provisional answer, yes, more so than the second than the first, but perhaps not as much as you might think. Thank you. Stephen Munning. Stephen. Good evening, Gary. Thanks for your oh, presentation. Another blast from the past. I have so hi, hi Stephen. <laughs> um, was there any material difference, Gary, in the leadership qualities demonstrated in territorial units between the Great War and the Second War? I'm sorry, could you say the question again? Was there any material difference in the leadership qualities oh. demonstrated by officers in the territorial formations between the two wars? Um, I think the answer is no, but with caveats. And the first thing to say is when, when talking about the the territorials. Actually, I gave an online lecture for, it wasn't for the WFA, it was for another group, but I've, I've talked about this from my own, my own research list recently. Broadly speaking, you're to divide territorials into two, two different sorts. There's the class core, the middle class, London Scottish, London Rifle Brigade, Liverpool Scottish, that sort of thing, um, and everybody else. The vast majority of the, of the territorials in both world wars are um, working class units. Uh, and there is a big difference. In 1938-39, um, in when the territorial army is, is, is doubled, um, the units like the London Rifle Brigade have long queues of people on their waiting list who want to join up. And as the uh, commander of the London Division at the time says, there's no way that someone who wants to join the London Rifle Brigade would join the Tower Hamlets Rifles. You know, uh, a pub... A, public school clerk isn't going to go off and join a, 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 a bunch of chippy cockneys. And so there is a big division. The, um, the class corps, so-called so class corps, had many more uh, public or grammar school educated uh, men, so therefore they had, at least in theory, more le le leadership potential. The difference, I think, between the two world wars is not so much the personnel, which I think is much of a muchness, but actually what happened to them. For the territorials, um, in, in the First World War, they were committed very, very soon. 
to the Western Front. So the, the London Scottish and the Oxfordshire Hussars were, I think, the first two, two regiments to, 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 to see active service. You've again got the 42nd Division, the East Midland, uh, uh, East, sorry, East, I beg your pardon, the East Lancashire Division, sent off to Egypt and then Gallipoli. In other words, what we saw was a lot of territorial saw service very soon. In the Second World War, you didn't get that same uh, uh, effect, not least because those territories are sent to, to France, to the Western Front. Fighting doesn't actually begin until May 1940. And the regular army, as I mentioned, gets its chance to sort of get their fingers on, on ter ter territorial units. And those territorial units who do see active service, for example, in the, in the Norway campaign, are extremely poorly prepared. Um, I can't remember the exact figures or, or indeed the, the, the names of the units, but some units have been, they've been sort of commanding, uh, sorry, um, guarding vulnerable points, places like railway junctions. Then they're hoovered up and sent off to Norway and told to go off and fight the Wehrmacht. Not surprisingly, they did not do, did not to, do terribly well. So I think the, the territorials in both world wars had a pretty tough baptism of fire but the fact they got into action earlier in the first world war enabled them to sort of build up a reserve of leadership and frankly allow junior leaders to come through the ranks earlier than it, than it did in the second world war second world war of course some divisions and battalions did extremely well at the beginning of the war others by the time they get into the fighting in the western desert in italy well, to what extent is the 51st Highland Division still a, a territorial division by the time of Alamein? You know, many of the original soldiers have been shipped out, no new people have been, been shipped in. So the ter there, there is an argument that it, basically the territorial units have ceased to be territorial in any real sense by the middle of the Second World War. There are some exceptions, but I think that, that, that's gen generally true. So both world wars, the territorials had bit of a bad deal at the beginning of the war I'd say. Thanks for your question there Stephen, appreciate it. Um, William Rosenfeld. Thank you very much uh, Professor Sheffield for your uh, very uh, very enlightening uh, lecture. My comment or my question really relates to the contrast between the Canadian and Australian armies and the the British army. You've commented uh, on the uh, class issue in relation to the Australian Army. There are many in Canada um, uh, and Canadian historians who, who might wish to have a discussion with you on that regard because... Um, well, believe me, uh, I have. <laughs> pardon me? Believe me, I have, with the likes of yeah. Tim Cook and so on. Yeah, so... Um, uh, as uh, one who is familiar with the uh, quasi-public school system in Canada, I would suggest there is a very large distinction. However, my question is related really to the glass ceiling. Uh, both uh, the commander of the Canadian Corps and the commander of the Australian Corps were part-time uh, soldiers at in, in 1914. And um, Monash Curry succeeded to a com Corps Command in contrast to the British Army where such senior positions were never occupied by uh, non-professionals. So um, I'd appreciate your comments on the different structures of the Canadian and Australian Officer Corps Corps in uh, relation to the British Officer Corps. Sure, thank you. Um, uh, I, I th maybe Pete, Pete Simpkins can correct me. I don't. I think the highest ranking British non-professional soldier was a Major General. There, there, there were two or three divisional commanders who were not regulars, but I, I think you're right. No one got to Corps Command in the First World War. Um, well, the, the difference is that basically Australia did not have a regular army at all, effectively before 1914. And so the Australian Imperial Force was largely based on the old militia, the equivalent of, of, of the territorials. Um, and given that there was a distinct push 
from 1916 onwards to promote Australian officers. Many of the senior officers of the AIF in 1914, 15, 16 had of course been British on, on secondment. Because there was a push to promote Australians, they were going to have to be um, part-time soldiers, ex-militiamen. Ex, ex um, so that's un understandable. And of course, um, oh, complete brain freeze. Uh, Australian commander in, in the Middle East commanded Ch Chevelle, Harry Chevelle, actually was a corps commander before Monash was. So there were at least two Australian corps commands in the first, in the first World War. Almost, but not quite the same for us for Canada. Of course, being Canadian, you'll, you'll know that the Canadian Army did have a, a permanent force, but it was very small. Uh, the PPCLI, the Royal Canadian Regiment, was there another, was there a third one? Can't remember. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But anyway, but uh, point being that the, uh, the, the CEF, the Canadian Expeditionary Force, was also largely built upon the, the militia, the territorial equivalent. And so it was a very good chance that, uh, again, when Canadianisation was put in from 1916 onwards, that whoever got the Canadian Corps would be a part-time soldier. Um, so I think in structural terms, it's easy to explain, but, it, but it, of course it's more to it, to it than that. But, but Monash, Chevelle, uh, and Curry were all extremely efficient soldiers. Um, had they been Brits, they almost certainly would not have got the opportunity that they got uh, being in, in the Dominion armies. And you know, by any standards, this much, I think, must be seen as being a wasted resource. And again, come to the Second World War, the British Army did the same thing all over again. It was a meritocracy up to a certain point, uh, but beyond divisional brigade command and effectively beyond divisional command, if you weren't a member of the amalgamated union of regular officers, you weren't going to make it. And I think the, the Canadian Australian systems were clearly better in that respect. Well, th th thanks for that, Gary. Thanks, William, for, for your question. You did actually ask um, Pete um, if he'd care to comment. So, um, Pete, um, I've dragged you uh, kicking and screaming back, <laughs> back onto the panel there. Uh, do, um, let's just see. Yeah, you're live, Peter. Do, is there any, do you want to come in there on, on Gary's point? Well, just, just that we need John Bourne here at the moment, I think, <laughs> with, uh, with generals. Um, I, I, I can add that I think... That, in 1918, only 11 territorials had reached Brigadier General rank. Mm -hmm. uh, two I can quote from the 50th Division were Richard Sugden, whose family owned a flour mill in Brighouse, Yorkshire. Uh -huh. And the other was George Rollo, who was from a family of marine engineers in Liverpool. Those are two I, I can think of. But if you think of all the brigadier generals in the British Army in 1918, only 11, I think, John Bourne will forgive me from angels on high if I'm wrong. Uh, so that, that would give you an indication. Yeah, th thanks, Pete. Well, one, 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 I, I can add another one to, to your list. Noel Lee commanded the Manchester Brigade uh, at Gallipoli, uh, who was... Uh, he he was... Um, he was part of a family of, of, of a manufacturing family mm. in the Manchester area. And uh, William Marshall, who was a regular officer and of course went on to command, I think, ultimately Mes Mesopotamia, was at Gallipoli as, as a brigadier. And he was sent to shadow, in other words, to breathe down the neck of Noel Lee. Um, because I think it was Hunter Bunter didn't trust Lee to, to command his brigade effectively. Marshall pitched up and in about five minutes realised that Lee was, was completely co competent, a very good soldier. It was rather embarrassing between the two of them. Um, Lee was then killed or died, died of wounds in June 1915. And I've sometimes thought that if he had lived, would he have made divisional commander on the Western Front? Potentially could even have made three star um, because he actually had been to Eton and only didn't go to Sandhurst because his father and sister, he went into family business. So not only was he uh, of the right sort of social background, you know, he was very much a sort of regular officer monk. But of course, 
he, he died in, in June 1915, so we'll never know. Thanks for that, Gary, and uh, thanks for your, your help there, Pete. Uh, Judith, um, I don't think you've got a, a video. Hi, Gary, are you well? Hi, Judy, I'm very well, thank you, yes. Good. It's one of my usual vague type questions. You've partially answered it. I was interested in how the sort of morale and in, um, encouragement was going on in, say, in the Second World War, and say, special forces and the medical um, branch, but I think you've partly dealt with it. My other slight observation was, were these sort of um, values and class issues, uh, what happened in the emerging women's officers in the Second World War? I've only, I only just thought about it while I was yeah. listening to you. Uh, well, I, I, again, I, I, I will declare my, largely my ignorance uh, on this, but to say that uh, a book by one of my very good friends, uh, Jeremy Crang, who's a professor at the University of Edinburgh, um, he's just about to produce a book on women's services in the Second World War, so that's, that's the, thing, the thing to read. Um, what, 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 I, what I can say is that it strikes me that you go through many of the same sort of problems um, with the women's services in both world wars uh, as with the men. There are a couple of differences. So first, of course, women, um, at least in part for the First World War, are not properly commissioned. And in the Second World War, they saw commissions of a sort, but they don't have the same rank structure as the, as the men. So, for example, uh, I, I think the equivalent of a second lieutenant is, is a junior under officer. But surprise, surprise, if you're middle class or upper class, you tend to become an officer. If you're not, you don't. And you have many of the same sorts of um, um, sort of, you know, sort of problems going on here. I'm just reading uh, Martin Francis's book, The Flyer, at the moment, which is about, which is a, a cultural history of the Royal Air Force in the Second World War, which is extremely good read. And um, I've just read the chapter about relations between male airmen and, and WAF, so, so female members of the RAF, on, on, on fire from bomber stations during the war. And you've got all sorts of levels of discipline and snobbery and what have you mixed together because for a start, um, women, uh, male and female members of the, of the Royal Air Force are not supposed to socialize, particularly they're not supposed to form relationships. Um, even worse is you've got a commissioned officer forming a relationship with uh, a non-commissioned WAF. And one of, the, one of the daftest things I came across was there was a, an account from uh, an officer who's sitting in, 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 in a mess, I think on, on a bomber station in, in, in the Second World War, and this attractive WAF waitress uh, comes up to him and puts a pint of Guinness in front of him. And the chap who's with, with, with him says, uh, how, how does she know what you drink? And he had to come up with some sort of, you know, really sort of feeble excuse. Turns out they're married, but the REF frowned upon, um, you know, a, a, a marriage between a commissioned officer and, uh, and another rank uh, woman. And basically, they kept quiet about it because it just made life so much easier. Um, I can't imagine things were any simpler for the army. Thanks for that, Gary. Thank um, and thanks, Judith, for, for your question. Rattling through the time available quite, quite a, a bit, so um, I'm not no, going can to... Can I just say, if someone wants to ask me a question but doesn't manage to get it in this time, feel free to email me. I'm easy to find on the internet and I'll do my best to answer your question. Sure enough. Thanks for that, Gary. Uh, Anthony Davis. Anthony, I'm just going to... Right, you, you, you're live, Anthony. Right. In, oh, thank you. Question, please. Right, thank you, Gary. A great lecture. Really thank you. that. Um, Rudyard Kipling famously pulled strings to get John a commission in the Second Irish Guards. Mm. How widespread was that sort of using the old school network? It was extremely common at the beginning of the war and John was commissioned late 14, early 15 I think. Uh, much more difficult at the end of the war because it was much more rigorous that actually 
you could get a commission without going through the ranks first, but it was very difficult. So, so yeah, you, you found a lot, a lot at the beginning of the war, but much, much less late, 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 late later on. Mm. Um, uh, it's a case, an example of the way in which the army, I think, became more professional as, as the war went on. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for that. Thanks for your question, Aaron. Um, David Snape, I I'm going to uh, come to you next, and then um, after David, we'll go to Gordon for the last question. But David, it's all yours. Hi, Gary. Just like Hi, old David. times, listening to you. <laughs> How are you? Um, my question is really about the Indian Army and the relationship between VCOs and, and the British officer and the fact that even Wilcox begged that uh, that w wouldn't change, that VCOs wouldn't be put in charge. How was the transition towards the Second World War? Okay, well, I should actually say that um, I'm not covering the Indian Army in <laughs> my book, so this is based on my, 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 my general knowledge. Um, there is, for all sorts of reasons, as, as I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know, there is a change in the way the army is organised in India in the interwar period. In yeah. part, this is a reflection of a growth of nationalism among Indians. It also, I think, reflects a, a pragmatic realisation that they made life difficult for themselves in the First World War by relying so heavily on um, British, British officers. And as a result, the, the VCO, for those who don't know, the Viceroy's Commission officers were Indian officers, but they were inferior in status to, to, to the British officers. Um, increasingly, now I can't remember whether this is actually the VCO themselves or a new rank is, in, is in, introduced. So this is, this is something I, I need, need to go on to, uh, to, to look up on. But by the end of the war, you have far more Indians uh, in key command positions, including commanding British officers, uh, which would never have happened in the First World War in, in, the, in, in the interwar period. Um, Tarak Bakawi's recent book, or two or three years ago book on, on the Indian Army in, in, in the Second War is, World War is really interesting on this. And what happens in effect is that the, the British sort of take almost a, you know, a, 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 a devil's bargain. In order to provide sufficient officers for the Indian Army, they need to broaden the pool in which they're fishing, which basically means commissioning more Indians. But in order to do so, they're, they're commissioning the, mo the most educated section of the Indian community who tend to be nationalist in politics. Yeah. And so therefore they're, in a sense, robbing Peter to pay Paul. They're actually, they're solving the immediate problem, but stirring up uh, a good deal of problem for the post-war period. And we get to the stage by 1945, 1946, the shrewder British Indian Army officers are realising that independence is pretty well inevitable. Um, and yet the, the Indian Army in the Second World War, a bit of a rocky start if you look at what happens in Singapore, uh, mm -hmm. late 41, early 42. The Indian Army does, 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 uh, does, does pretty well in the desert and in Italy and exceptionally well as part of 14th Army. Slim's 14th Army in 1945 only 13% are actually British soldiers. Mm. There's some East Africans, West Africans, the bulk of people are from the Indian subcontinent. Yeah. So basically this is an Indian army uh, winning the war. Yeah. And Indian officers at all levels play a really key role in this. Um, yeah, we can be counterfactual, go back to the First World War, because the Indian army also does pretty well in the First World War as well. What if they'd actually broadened the officer core of, of the Indian army at that stage? Would it have simply meant you know more nationalists earlier, or would it actually have sort of cemented um, the Indian middle classes more firmly supporting the Raj? We can't know, but but clearly the the Indian Army is a remarkable organisation in both world wars, and in, in in the Second World War I think it does exceptionally well, and not least because of the number of Indian Army uh, Indians it actually takes on board as as officers. Thank you. Thanks, David. For your question. Thank you. There. Thanks. Um, Gordon. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Gary, 
Hello, Gordon. How do you... Good afternoon. Good evening. Excellent presentation, by the way. I've enjoyed it enormously. How did the British officer corps compare with those of the, the French and the German armies in both wars, really? Okay. Um, start with the French. The French army in 1914 has got a very high percentage of promoted rankers as, as officers, uh, mm -hmm. which is, of course, in part, that's because it is a conscript army. Now, um, it's, it's a few years since I did any reading of this, and people might have come up with more research on this recently, but my, my memory is that despite the fact that you have, that you have uh, this strong basis of, of people who have served in the ranks who are now officers, relationships between the ranks were not particularly good. In part, that's because I think officers uh, or soldiers, probably truthfully, thought their officers knew too much about the tricks that soldiers get up to. And also because the French officer corps did not have this sort of paternalistic ethos embedded in it in the same way as the British officer corps did. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the French army has this huge mutiny in 1917 is because the French army officers are simply not very good at ensuring that the mail comes up, that troops are well fed, that their feet are expected. The sort of things that sort of, sort of bread and butter to British officers uh, is, is not so common in the French army. In fact, one of the things that Pétain does when he comes in in 1917 is to try and change that. Um, so French army in the Second World War, I don't know enough about to comment. German army in the First World War, um, if you read Alex Watson's book, can't think what it's called, but anyway, but it's, it's, it's a book which came out about 10, 15 years ago, which compares morale in the British and German armies in the First World War. And what comes out of that is the, Brit the German army is actually much closer in many ways to the British army than you might expect. The German army certainly in British eyes are all sort of robots, you know, marched all over the place and what have you. In reality, he says that German soldiers are much, um, on the whole, probably more reliant on self-discipline, which says something about the relationship with their officers. And like British officers, German officers do have a paternalistic streak, although my reading of it is that it's not quite as strong as in the, as in the British, Army, British Army. Second World War German Army, of course, it's very different because uh, the, the old um, um, Kaiserreich Army, uh, is is an old is a is an, an old an old school army. The Wehrmacht and the SS, of course, is ideologically based. Uh, it, it's it's reliant on absolutely ruthless discipline. Now, it's not to say that good relations could not be built up between soldiers and officers. But there's always the fear of the officer's pistol, or of you know the the, the Germans don't exactly have political commissars, you know, but falling out of line and sort of you know ending up. With, with with problem problems that way. So whereas the, the, the British Army of the first Second World War is recognisably the same in terms of officer man relations as, as, as the German as the British Army of the First World War, I think the contrast between the German Army of the two world wars in terms of morale and discipline and officer man relationships is actually quite different because of the ideological element you get in the Second World War. Oh. Super. Th thanks ever so much indeed for your question, Gordon. Thanks for the answer there, Gary, and thanks uh, for, for, for answering all of those questions. Um, I try to finish about half past nine, generally, um, but we've overrun, <laughs> which is... Uh, can, I, can, I, can I just have a quick plug for my course? Uh, by all means, plug away, absolutely. Well, at, at, at least half the people asking me questions this evening are graduates of the MA in the history of Britain and the First World War we run at the University of Wolverhampton. We're still recruiting for October uh, this year starts. If you're interested at all, please do get into contact. We also run a sister course on the history of the Second World War and uh, a part-time online course on, on, on military history. All, all of them part-time aimed exactly at people like you. If you're interested, please do get in touch. Thanks for that, Gary. Um, so um, we, we we have overrun, um, but uh, in in the tradition of what we do do, um, if you'd like to raise your hands as a as a final round of applause um, for Gary, 
Unfortunately, Gary won't be able to see these hands shooting up. I, I can, um, and, and clearly, uh, please take it from me, Gary, if that is a, a, a resonating round of applause from, from, from everybody. I just, we just can't hear it, that's all. Thank you um, very much indeed. <laughs> thanks very much. Um, Gary, that was a, a wonderful lecture. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I could tell from the questions that came out of it that everybody really enjoyed that uh, as, uh, as much as I, I certainly did. And um, it's been a, a wonderful evening. Um, on, on that note, really, I think we'll just say thanks very much indeed, Gary, for your hard work and the, the presentation. And um, everybody who's watched this, please, um, if you're not a member of the Western Front Association, please do join us. Um, if you uh, are interested in listening to more of these, we're having a break next week. Uh, being Bank Holiday Monday, um, we, we're, we're not going to run a, a webinar, but we'll be back in a fortnight's time um, with um, Jim Beach and uh, and uh, and and his co-pilot Jock, who will be talking about uh, British signals intelligence in, in the First World War. So that's one uh, to tune into um, and register for if you're interested. And a very final plug from me is going to be. Uh, the Western Front Association 2021 calendar is currently working its way through the system. So if anybody uh, wishes to purchase a calendar for next year, watch this space. Um, uh, it's not a requirement to, to buy it, but these webinars are being run um, free of charge. So um, if you'd care to just uh, um, buy a WFA calendar just to recognise the uh, the, the, the work that's gone into these webinars that would be splendid anyway that's the enough of the commercials <laughs> and um gary thanks very much indeed um and uh, good evening everybody and i'll see you in a couple of weeks time thanks very much thank you good night everyone good night Mademoiselle from Armentier.